is the hard work and passion. You ready? Ready. Okay. Welcome, 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 welcome. This is the Beyond Take Two podcast brought to you by Beyond Hollywood International Film Festival. I am your host, Madge, and today we have a special, special, special guest in the building with us. Uh, this man is a 2023 uh, Best LGBTQ Film winner uh, this year at our film festival. Um, he comes from a long line of great directors, filmmakers, and now he is making his claim in the industry. And we're so happy to have him here with us today. Uh, the great Leonardo Corbucci is in the building, everybody. Leo, how you doing? Wow, what an introduction. Thank you so much. <laughs> no problem. How you doing? Unbelievable. Man? Yeah, maybe the best introduction of my life. Who knows? Hey, I, I hope it's not of your life, man. <laughs> I hope it ain't your life. It's great, it's great. What can I say? Like, like you can hear, I'm born and raised in Texas, yep. right? <laughs> <laughs> and so, no, I'm just kidding. With this <laughs> accent and with this family name, Corbucci, yeah, Corbucci, there is only one place that I can come from. Indeed, indeed. Italy. Indeed, indeed. So it's a, it's a big trip. It's a big, you know, yeah. like very far. What brings this Italian guy here? <laughs> <laughs> well, we we go, we go we gonna get into that in a minute, but first we have our buttered up segment. So what we do on this podcast every week we try a different popcorn. Today we have skinny pop white cheddar. Uh, we take it out, try it, rate it one through ten. So as a director, oh, I'm a big fan. Anna. So I'm going. Yeah, do you think? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, food is a big element of my life, <laughs> as any other Italian that yeah. you know. You can pour it in the bowl. I will. Yeah. Oh, the smell is great already. <laughs> so we have Skinny Pop White Cheddar today, everybody. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try it, all right? Yeah. Mm. And then... Uh... Mmm. Mm-hmm. I love it, and consider the fact that I come from um, a movie that I watched yesterday until two thirty a.m. <laughs> and I had like a kilo, you know, like <laughs> of popcorn. So <laughs> this popcorn was better than the movie theater yesterday. Really? Yeah, I like it. Maybe a little bit more salt for my taste. Yeah, I like it more salty. But they're, they're really good. I really like them. It is a good popcorn. Mm -hmm. I don't taste the white cheddar, though. That's right. It's supposed it's a, to be white it's cheddar. It's very light. But, you know, if, if it was very strong, maybe you will get bored after a while. So maybe yeah. it's okay that it's very light. I would say from 0 to 10, I yeah. will give it a 7 and a half. 7 and a half. Um, I will, it is a really good popcorn. Like, the actual popcorn is really good. Um... But because there's no white cheddar flavor, let me try one more. Okay, yeah. Maybe you were just unlucky. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't get the... Okay, I got a little bit. Okay. Maybe they should write mix. But... Yeah, it's a, it's a really good popcorn, but I'm going to have to give it... Um... Oh, God. I'm very hard on these popcorns. Um... You're a snobbish. Yeah, I am. I am. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, oh, I'm upset because the popcorn is really good. I'm going to have to give it a six. All right. All right. Oof. Give it a six, yeah. They barely made it. Skinny Pop, um, you have a really good popcorn, but for the white cheddar, I'm going to need uh, more white cheddar flavor. Um, but great job. Um, appreciate it. You guys want to send us some more popcorn? Send it through. All right. Please. So, Leo. <sighs> Tell, tell us about your story. You come from Italy. Um, how did you end up in Hollywood, man? All right. So um, I started the film school very early. I, I was curious about movies um, from a very early age. Um, I did the National Italian Film School. And then from there, I went to Bulgaria. That is an East European country. Yeah. And um, I did my first feature film there. And I need to be honest, that was a paradise back in that time because there was still film. My mm. first feature film is in 35 millimeters. Okay, okay. That according to a lot of filmmakers, I'm lucky that I was able to do at least one movie in, in film, right? Right, right. 
and the visual quality was so much better. I need to be honest. And it's, the, it's better than digital. Yeah, yeah. I need to say, you know, the highlights, the even today, the organic feeling of of film. Most of the time, is better. Mm. Let's say. Back in that time, for sure, digital was like not even 4K. Uh, and so you were obligated to, to shoot a, a movie in 35 millimeters if you yeah. were serious to do a movie. Right. The process was much more complicated, but um, it was a different process. You didn't waste so much. You didn't just push record and forget about it. Mm. And uh, so it was, was a, a little bit different how to make movies with, with these cameras. They were huge, big cameras. Yeah. And... Uh, I really enjoyed it. He was very cheap. That was the reason why we went to Bulgaria in the uh-huh. beginning. So it was something that is insane. I remember a detail like um, you could have uh, rent a crane and put 25 meters of rails with a dolly on top. And in the dolly, you can put two people, the camera operator and the focus puller. Oh, wow. And gasoline for the whole day. For twenty five dollars per day. Oh wow! Back in the time, that was insane. When, when was that? <laughs> I'm not gonna say the time. Yeah. I am a How little. How old bit, are you, Leo? I, I am a little bit old. I'm not a vampire, though. I'm not that old. But uh, he was more than ten years ago, let's say. Mm-hmm. And so that's the reason why we went to Bulgaria and they did this first film with Mone from Italy called um, Black and White in Colors. Okay. I fell in love with Bulgaria. I really, really enjoyed the time there. And I get very close to a post-production place and production place that was there in Bulgaria, organizing also all the commercials for yeah. the country. And I spent one year to, to produce this movie. And mm. in the end, the, you know, the, the post-production company that helped me to do the movie, they asked me, hey, Leo, there is any chance you want to stay and make some commercial with us? And, and they stayed. And, and they really liked the, the no. vibe. And, and from there, then my next step was... Um, Coming here in the uh, in United States, I did some extension courses in UCLA okay. of filmmaking. And I, I did work um, basically for free in, in big companies. And I started to put my feet in the, in the industry. Okay. And then step by step, I, I moved here. I continued to do movies like uh, Legendary ID. That is a documentary that went very well. Mm-hmm. One more time, that was an independent movie. And then we did also a TV show, a sci-fi TV show called Cyborg Universe. Okay. And other small movies and documentaries until this uh, With Myself, that is this uh, drama. Okay. That, uh, I won the festival with. Okay. And I think that, um, you know, the dream of every filmmaker that is uh, outside the United States, if you are dreaming to have a, a career, you know, making movies, you always dream to, to come to Hollywood, Los Angeles. Right, right. And, and the approach for a foreigner is, is very different, uh, you know, because um, it is very different. Hollywood for what you're expecting. Right. Oh, okay. So, so what what did you expect? I, mean. I don't know. Back in the time, I think the first time I, I come, I thought Hollywood was a community, meaning that there was really a, a town that was focused on filmmaking, but in the in the creative, you know, way. Right. And then I find out it was it was just a, a propaganda, let's be honest. <laughs> It's a propaganda. <laughs> there is no real, real Hollywood, and and is a status, you know, Hollywood mm. more than a place, more than a society, more than is a status that that the studios used to be able to produce this glamour right. around and the star system, and it did work. Right, because, right. You know, they they made their movie stars. They sold the movies with their movie stars. They create the vibe. And, and and so people come and, and yeah. they come as well. But I, I need to be honest, I like the people that I found here because it's a big mix of everybody, mm-hmm. you know. I I think um, Los Angeles is a zoo and I mm. am one of the animals of this right. zoo. <laughs> one of the exotic animals. <laughs> He's an exotic animal of this zoo. So, and I think that's the beauty of it. And I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of things work much better here in LA, you know? Diversity right. or uh, LGBTQ+, and then make movies to try to, um, 
you know, convince the audience and, and the people to accept everybody right. in every single direction. I right. think Los Angeles is, is a very good city mm. that can prove to the world that, you know, we can coexist right, right. You know, and, and like each other even if we are not exactly the same. Same, right, 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 exactly. So no, it's, it's definitely a, a whole melting pot. Um, and you know, Los Angeles is so big, like, you know, you could go to like different, com- like there's times where I've been in communities. I- I've lived here my whole life and I found places like little pockets, like That's right. the hell is it? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Because I'm here from 15 years after all. It's a long time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I always discover and find new places. You right. Know? Yeah. Different kind of vibe. Yeah. And. And it's amazing because the the city is like a nation. And definitely, like, definitely. So many different places and different people. I, I really love it, and, and yeah. so I'm really happy to be here for this reason. That for sure. Yeah. And and in somehow I need I need to be honest. This movie was kind of I feel a responsibility mm. to enter in the game and 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 to tell a story. Right. About what if you know a girl find her real uh, sexuality or attraction on the move to do something else. Right. Know? And right. she wasn't educated to face this problem. You know? Exactly. What you will do, what she will do, how she will approach with, with her mother, with her friends, you know. And and, and we're talking like, about the movie with yes. myself. Right. right. And and so I really like the the challenge to to go in this direction because in somehow to be part of this city you feel uh, I don't know if it's entitled or the responsibility <laughs> to to talk about this topic and yeah, yeah, yeah. other topics. Well, I mean, I think it's you know, the these are these are things that people go through. You know what I mean? And, and especially like the setting of with myself, you know, it's it's set in the you know, the pandemic, right? So she goes through this horrible situation and, you know, by herself she she goes through these highs and lows of really trying to find out like who she is and what she really wants with her life. So, I mean, that's, and, and, you know, it's, it's based off of, you know, finding her sexuality, but, you know, people are trying to find out many things about themselves. Many you know things, I mean? Especially in that time that recluded at home. So the movie talk about this story that she's alone at home and she's spending so much time uh, in this dating app that right. I think is a lot of, you know, it's the same story of a lot of other people. Oh, yeah. Social media yeah. and dating app. And this is this is brand new for right. humans. Right, you know, this right, This is also right. something that people need to understand, that we get connected to each other only in the last, you know, 10, 15 years. Right. I don't know if the world and humans were ready to be so connected and to share every single moment, this picture, this and that, and be able to go in a website, take up some a lot of picture of ourselves, and say I'm looking for this, and try to be connected. So right. it's it's something very new, and and during the pandemic was was an extreme situation because you couldn't move from home, and I'm sure a lot of people went uh, through. Um, you know, a journey to oh, yeah. discover themselves, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's especially for, like, people that were actually, like, by themselves. Like, you know, I was fortunate enough, you know, I have a wife, three kids, so, you know, we're, we're kind of in it together, but a lot of people didn't have that. Well, I mean, that's know? a point of view, because a lot of people, you know, didn't like to share the same place <laughs> with their wife or girlfriend, end up to divorce or fight, so... I think that that's a point of view, you know. A lot right, of couples, right. a lot of couples will say, "I was, you know, I was lucky in my life that I was very busy going around." Then a pandemic started, and I was obligated to be at home with my wife twenty four seven. And I'm like, I'm looking at them, and like, obligated? Uh, <laughs> don't you want to be home? Just like that, a challenge or something? <laughs> so I think that's a, that's a point of view. Yeah, and a lot of you know. No, that that's that's no, that's that's actually true. <laughs> Because, I mean, a, a lot of people like to s- spend their time outside the home. Yeah, a lot of people like, my wife is like that. She likes her me time. You know what I mean? Like, so I, I can imagine it was probably a challenge for her just having me in her face every day. 
So she would probably take the other perspective. All I think right. you're right. I yeah. love the situation. You know, you're like, oh, I was so lucky. I had my wife in front of me every single day, every single minute. And she will be here looking at you like, right, right. Uh-huh. Yeah, you know mm-hmm. I wanted your ass out the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's an extreme situation created by, an, you know, something extreme. And and this is what the stories of people, I don't know if it's going to happen again, what is going to happen. Because people uh-huh. after this experience, I don't know, I think they're going to... They're gonna flip more. They're gonna rebel more because if if it happened again, well, I mean, something like that is not gonna happen like back to back. You know, <sighs> I mean, an, another mm, nah. People sure. wouldn't people wouldn't go for it. Yeah, people wouldn't go for it. And and you know, it's it's difficult because I mean, you know, you have a government that you can sometimes trust, sometimes not, and you know, now everybody has a voice. So, you right. know, you looking on your phone and you scrolling through, people present themselves as professionals mm-hmm. or intellectuals, can tell you anything. You know what I mean? And, you know, there's there's just so much take taken in. Um, you know, it's easy to be uh what's the word? It's is it's easy to feel like, you know, you're being deceived. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. So, yeah, yeah. It, 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 it'll be tough if something like that happened again. But I, I doubt if something like that. Yeah, I agree. Time, so. Yeah, I hope so. At least I hope. But I need to be honest that life becomes so complicated in every single aspect. And, you know, yeah. and this pandemic was, for me, like, look like trying to make our life even more complicated of what it is, you know? Let me see how these little humans can can react <laughs> on, on this problematic. Just because life is not complicated enough for them, right. let's put this on stress, you know? Yeah. That was crazy. Yeah, it's uh, it's something. But we yeah. went through. Yeah, we got through, man. You, you know what was really um, interesting, though? Um, I was driving when the pandemic first started. I was going. I don't know where I was going. Like but, most of the people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know where I'm at it, but I was on a 110 uh, freeway. I think I said this on this pod before, but I was on a 110, and you know, usually there you could see the small coming from where I come from. You could see like the smog above downtown. The only time it's clear is when it rains. Like, if it rains, then the next day you go up to 110, like, it's super clear, it's beautiful. Right. After maybe, like, three weeks in the pandemic, I drove on the 110, and I mean, just clear. Beautiful. Like, three cars on the freeway. <laughs> That's right. I mean, it like, that was, like, a moment for me. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Like, through all, like, the, the crazy shit that was happening, that was, like... Oh, like <laughs> a breathing moment. Like, okay. That's beautiful. You know what I'm saying? Like the city is so beautiful. You know, when all these mm-hmm. fucking cars ain't polluting the, and all these companies ain't polluting the goddamn sky. So mm-hmm. it was a, uh, it was interesting. You know, you you, you had your little, you had your little moments. Mm-hmm. Um, and for sure, a lot of people that they took for granted a lot of situations yeah. after the pandemic, they realize how how lucky they are. You know? Oh yeah. Even to be in a, such a great city like Los Angeles, we complain a lot about traffic, this and that. But when after the pandemic, I think I realized, oh, wait a minute, the city offers so much. Yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, you wouldn't want to be in bumfuck Kentucky no. uh, during the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, like uh, to be at home 24 hours um, in a city like Los Angeles doesn't make any sense. Right, you right. you gotta be out because the city offers so much that if you want to stay just at home, and I think a lot of people move out from LA, for example, after the pandemic because yeah. they, psychologically, they were thinking, you know, if I am at home alone, this city is, is only overpriced, nothing else. Right, right. Because obviously the inside of a house, right. of a home, is the same in Los Angeles or in Idaho or Montana or right, Louisiana exactly. in the middle of the countryside, yeah. right? So people, after the pandemic, start to think, um, maybe I want to move to Idaho, Louisiana or Montana mm. in the countryside and have a bigger house and place for the amount of money that I'm, I'm spending. I'm spending you know? right, right. Because if you don't have a city to enjoy, because you can with the pandemic, so 
what is the point? So a lot of people move out from Los Angeles, yeah. and they and I heard that a lot of people that did that choice now <laughs> they are considering they, they, to they regret, come back, yeah, trying to come back, to come back. And this, yeah, I mean, it's 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 hard to leave this like a city like L.A. Um, I mean, I haven't lived in a lot of different places. I've I lived in Houston for a year. Um, you know, I've visited a lot of different places, but people ask me, like, my wife always asks me, like, you know, would you move? Like, and I'm just like, nah, nah, <laughs> like, where? Like, why? <laughs> it's, it's like, I like visiting places, but like, moving? Nah, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine moving. This is my know. home. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> and, and yeah, and, Talking, you know, go going back to talk about Hollywood and movie movies and movie making. Yeah. Um, this is also another beautiful aspect, I think, of 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 Los Angeles. The fact that so many filmmakers move here to to try to become filmmakers, right. to start a career. That for a filmmaker is a great feeling to talk about movies with a lot of people. You know? Yeah, because yeah. The 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 amount of numbers. Of filmmakers and people that you can talk about it is 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 immense, you know. Yeah, it's, no, it's definitely, great. definitely. And composer, producer, actor. So one of one of the reason why you end up to like LA a lot if you are a filmmaker is because access. There are yeah. a lot of people like you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. so you enjoy life talking about this movie or this other movie, you know. Exactly. And uh, I know the industry is changing a lot. You know the. Is not anymore the eighty ninety uh, where the studios have so much power. Right. That I remember it was the first time the late ninety was the first time I arrived to Los Angeles and and the studio, the studios here had so much power that they almost shaped the city in a different way, you know. Mm. And and now the power is in the end of the the video on demand. Uh, right, right, right. Streaming services, streaming services, yeah. So in a way. He changed it, but in a way, it didn't really change it because these guys they just replaced the studio. They just replaced the studios with the same fucking. Well, I mean, like <laughs> even worse, like deals and even worse, you know, treatment of the the creatives that really make this thing happen. Even worse, and to be honest, right now in these days, we are going through this striking of SAG and um, screenwriters right. and 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 many others in in the film business. I was supposed to co-produce and help some people um, for a movie that was was supposed to to start in this month, but we postponed, and yeah. this changed a lot of lives, you know, oh, because yeah. uh, there are crew members that they need to film, so there are there are a lot of people that are making a living with, uh, with right. the filmmaking. So right. these strikes are are changing everything, and I think this is another important aspect of when you talk about. You know, to be a director, you know, and uh, how do you manage to, to even survive, and, and be an independent filmmaker? Right. I think that's that's an interesting question as well, with a lot of different way how how to answer. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, you know, I I, I tell I tell people now, um, you know, it's not enough to be um, just a director. Like, you have to be a business person as well. Like, you have to understand the business of filmmaking and, you know, how it all works, how will you, how you'll be able to make a living. You know, a lot of people just focus on the craft, the craft. And, you know, at a time that probably, probably was okay. But at this moment in time, it's like, you got to know what the fuck you're doing out there. Absolutely. But you said a very important detail if you want to make a living with filmmaking. Yeah. Because there are some artists that they don't accept compromise and they say, you know, I'm I'm fine. I make money in this way. Right. Or I don't need to make money. I know a lot of filmmakers that they don't need to make money. They have a situation where they don't. Right, and right. So they just do the movie that they really want to do yeah. for themselves. Yeah. And maybe the balance is the best way, you know, try mm. to find a balance where you find the compromise to do something that you really want to tell, but 
you know that there's going to be uh, an economical success that is bringing you back money. Right, right. But find that balance is really not that easy. Yeah, you know? well, it's very difficult. No, definitely. And I mean, if, if you're coming from a place where you don't need money, obviously you could do whatever you want, but... Most of the filmmakers that are out here, they need to make a living. Too. Absolutely, you know what I mean? absolutely. Especially in these days, like you said, because life becomes so expensive. Oh, yeah. So expensive. Yeah. Everywhere. Not only in Los Angeles. Oh, guys. Yeah. Don't think that LA is the is yeah. the yeah, you we're, know, is we're, the different. No, yeah. no, no. You can go to I don't know, Kent, Washington or Covington, Washington, mm. or in the middle of the Oregon. I've been there in these days and and, and then the salad is twenty bucks anyway. <laughs> And an espresso is five dollars anyway, <laughs> and you're like, wait a minute, am I in LA? Is, right, this, right. is this Silver Lake or Culver City or Santa Monica? Exactly. No, it's it's like Bend, Oregon. You know? I was I was um, on a flight one time, and the lady was from, um, I think she was from Seattle, but she was moving to Boise, Idaho. Mm-hmm. And she was like, she was like, Boise is almost expensive as LA now. Wow. I said, yeah, I believe Boise? It. I believe was, it. I believe it. She was like, Boise, I know. She was like, I got a house like, it was, she said it was a house like 250000 one it. year. And then the next year, it was like almost 600000 It's exactly <laughs> the same. If I ask you, do you know where is Covington, Washington? No, I don't know exactly where. Yeah, Covington. you have no idea. Like ninety nine percent of the population <laughs> of this planet, right? But the houses are right now seven hundred, seven hundred fifty, and it's like if you go out, you spend exactly the same of of Los Angeles, right? Right. And it's it's not supposed to be like this because it wasn't like this even five years ago, like you said. Right. No. Five no. years ago, before the pandemic, yeah, it was a. Precise location, the houses were two fifty. Yeah. I know because I was interested to buy a house there and, and now I'm not interested anymore, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so it's it's crazy how after the pandemic, even the outside of the other the countryside, the small town, you yeah. know, see, it's a situation it's a situation worldwide. Even back in Italy, you know, life is expensive, is really expensive in Italy as mm. well. To survive you need a lot of money. Right. And so, like we said, connecting with, with, with what we're talking about before, I think now more than before, a lot of filmmakers are like, I need to do a living. I need to find a solution how to make money, you know. Right. And and it, this is very interesting for me. We are entering in a very interesting territory. So in the last years, it becomes so easy to make movies. Mm. So easy. And I tell you why. First is the technology. The technology changes so much. Yeah. You know, from my first movie to shoot a movie in 35 millimeter, you need a crew of at least 40 people to go around. So 40? 40. Because the camera is very big, the tripod is very big, the doll is very big, everything is very big, and you need a lot of assistance, and you have film to manage. People need to change the film. And then mm. because you are taking a lot of space, you need permit. You can't really shoot gorilla when you are with film. And so you need a big crew, right? So today, the cameras become so small and the quality becomes so good. Right. And all the technology around, you know, focus system, there is a fallen focus that is amazing right now. And audio devices are become so cheap and mm. good, you know, that right. I remember when I was, when I shot my first movie, I know you would think I'm a vampire, but I'm not. When I shot my first movie, we were using Nagra. Nagra is, is a device that records sound in magnetic film. So oh, there is a wh- magnetic like a tape. Like, yes, there is a magnetic type that you manually you blue, you pull, you go around, you clip it, and then bloop, and you have like 15 minutes, the first Nagra that I use. And then in 15 minutes you need to open and change it again. Holy shit. It was so and that was the only way to record audio in a good quality. Mm. Absolutely the only way. There was no other way because wow. there weren't digital you know, microphones, there right, were right. even an iPhone to record in your iPhone. So the technology changed so much. But not only that, people change so much. Meaning that today, with all the social media, Instagram, TikTok, right. they step from having an audience on TikTok on want to become an actor is very close, guys. Mm. So there are a lot of people today that they want to be actors. Yeah. They want the audience, you know, because 
we are so everybody everybody today is so close to have an audience is mm. so close to be an actor right we're almost everybody actors in today's you know right to yeah. make selfies to make videos about ourselves yeah. to do the viral things and that so now the pool of actor that you can use is immense, it's immense compared right. to the past. Right, right. Because think about it, in the population, in the society, this reshaped the core of society, you know, the the, the whole thing. Because if you go back in time when social media wasn't here, yeah. how many actors you could have find in a small town or, or something, it's like, no, the only interaction that they had with entertainment is was watching TV. Right. You know, one way. Right. But now it's two way. <laughs> now it's social media. is is. I show you what I do and you show me what you do. Right. So now to find people to, to do a movie, it's, it's so much easier. And so we arrive at this point that we produce so many more movies. Yeah. It's yeah. insane. Yeah. Now, let me ask, do you think that's why the streaming services are the way that they are with not trying to give the actors and writers what they want because there's so many actors now, like there's so many, you know, options for them that they're just kind of devaluing the, the art form. All right. So the answer is very complicated. Yeah. And, and I think that this is one of the reason. All right. But it's very complicated. It go very that deep. And it's also a big portion, an economical problem as well. I mean, before there was, uh, a system in the TV where you have 24 hours, right? right? And you have it in paper, really. And when you fill the 24 hours in a channel, that's it. Right. You don't have any more space. Done, right? Mm. And so the residual system was working so beautiful because it's all there in paper. You know, you, right. you, you can't... That's yeah, you can't cheat. Planned, that's what channel it's on, and that's it. <laughs> there is really nothing to go around. And... If you, uh, you knew that you have enough money in advance to pay the residual because you have a budget for this, you know how many times this go on air, and then you make your calculation, done. Nobody can cheat, everything is there, beautiful, right? But with the streaming service, it's unlimited. So also the data is, is belong to these companies that they don't want to release. They don't want to share. But maybe it's also an excuse to don't pay the residual, exactly. right? But also the point is this, it's an economical problem. So uh, the streamers, they don't really make that money yet. So meaning Netflix and all these companies that they stream movies, you know, in the, in the commercial way, they're there for a hope and a promise that they will make the right amount of money for the investors that are behind. Netflix have some investors that are insane. They give so much money. They give infinity money, but they didn't recoup the money yet. So it's, it's just giving, 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 giving with the hope that the market will be so strong that they will recoup their money in the long run. Because producing so much stuff every year is very expensive. Right. It's not like YouTube that you make a movie for, for like, say, $600, yeah. 3000 These are using stars. They're making, Netflix is making movies and TV shows with $200 million, right? And, and so these are just one and they put it there and people watch it. Maybe people don't watch it and they want to know and they want to watch more and more and next and next. And so the amount of cash and, and money that you need to have to pay for all these movies is insane. And I don't think so that even practically they have the money to pay the residual. Guys, it's that simple. Netflix doesn't have the money to pay the residual to, to everybody. So they will never do it even for this, you know, simple fact. So, and, so why would they keep creating movies then if they know that... Okay, let me, let me ask you this. How, how, do, how, how many ways does Netflix, like, make money? Like, I know they make money from subscriptions. Is there any other way that they actually, like, make money? Well, we don't know exactly. I don't know exactly, for example, that you have a product replacement, right? Right. These are secrets of, of production. So right. they, may, they may use, like, uh, seven BMW in, in a movie and, and make 10 millions. How do I know? We don't know, right? Mm. We don't know if they use product replacement. For now, it's all about subscribers and all about 
the power, right? It right. is the same thing of social medias. In the beginning, Facebook, you know, and people were making fun of Zach because it's like, haha, you are not never gonna make money and you're wasting so much money. And he did, you know, right. he had investor and he, wa he, he wasted so much money, but he had a vision and he was right. right. That kid was right. right. He had a vision that the, the, the platform will expand so much that then you will have the data of all these people and the data of all these people is a lot of money right and no and people so he, pay a lot for it. and he starts to also introduce ads later in this application and the multiplication of money that he did was insane because in, in his from his perspective in his point of view the expense was zero the user does everything you know I put this picture I put this video I write the content and with one click, because it's a software, he go in the system, but I pay you $1,000 for three days. If you multiply this for every ads that they did, the, the guy become a billionaire so quick because right. the vision was right. So Netflix in somehow is trying to do the same thing, you know, saying and promise, listen, we will have the market. And maybe the, right now they, they do. Right. We will have the market and we will be able to do whatever we want. I don't know if they promise we're going to, push up the you know the fee from seven dollars five ninety nine whatever it is I don't know today to twelve dollars fourteen we're gonna put advertisement in a in a moment when we have everybody in the platform and mm -hmm. we're gonna make more money. I don't know. But the idea of having the market in their end is it's it's a big, 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 big you know, like uh, business and investors love it. And they were growing at the speed of light. Right. So that w w was making sense. So from the economical point of view, it's not very clear to, to, to understand. But from the filmmaker point of view, everything changed. You mm. know? So many more movies. I have an example that is, that is really funny that mm. I'm going to tell you. Because we are entering in another very huge problematic of filmmaking, distribution. And mm. I think today for a filmmaker, a director, a producer, this is the biggest problem that we have today. It's very easy to make a movie, right. but it's not very easy to find a proper distribution right. at all. Right. So this is the biggest obst obstacle of, of a filmmaker. And so how does it work really? You know, there is so much streaming. There is even free streaming. Right. How is that a problem if there are so many streaming services? Well, because we do not have yet the balance of how expensive it is to make a movie and how easy to recoup the money with whatever movie. Right. Meaning that we are still in the situation that your connections will help to find the right distribution. Mm. And this is a problem that we had from, from forever. From, right. from when I started the business, you know, I remember that connection was absolutely everything. You know? mm. And today is a problem as well, because i give you an example, you will understand. Let's say, do you know how many romantic Christmas movies they do every year? Um, it, it feels like over 100 <laughs> every year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we analyze the data, you know, for a production, and yeah. there are more than 500 romantic uh, comedy. New movies every year? Yes, every year there are more than 500 Christmas romantic comedies. New movies? Absolutely. Every year produced. Shit. Right? Now, Think about this. Every year, how many romantic <laughs> Christmas movies you watch? One to three, maybe. Right? Zero to three, let's right, say. Right, right. So that means what happened to the other 986, 87 right. you know, movies that have been produced are not there. Meaning that every year, guys, there are... 490 of these movies that they're being dis dis discharged, you know, and, and put it in a way, and they don't make it on Netflix, Hulu, Amazon. And now, let me ask you this. Is every year this romantic Christmas comedy amazing? No. 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 It's an okay movie. Yeah. And I'm sure that are okay movies even the others. Yeah. So... How in the world the right. distribution how, how company right. they choose which one to put in the in, right. in Netflix? Now this is a very interesting question. Yeah. If there are five hundred more than five hundred movies produced, romantic comedy during Christmas time, right? 
and the one that we end up to watch in Netflix and other, uh, other streaming right. are okay. They're not like, wow, I'm so glad in my life that I watched this movie. <laughs> no, they're okay. So that means that a guy working at, at Netflix has in front 500 movies like this that are okay, and he need to pick one. Which one he will pick and why? Mm. Come on. Mm. It's obviously yeah, that he needs to find a way to choose. I'm sure that he doesn't close his eyes and, right. <laughs> and point it out. I'm right, sure we're going to watch all 500 of them and then we're going to do <laughs> we're <gonna> vote. <laughs> that, you know, that's insane. So that means that there is still a connection. And another example is like, I am a very advanced filmmaker, right? Mm. I do a good living making movies, commercial and all of this. I still don't have a connection with Netflix. Right now, I don't know anybody working at, at Netflix. So if I do one of these romantic Christmas right. comedy, I, what, what do I do? I, I, there is not even an email to send Netflix. Hey, can you consider my movie? An address. There is not an address. And if you find an address and you send a DVD or, right. or, a, or a USB with your movie, it's celestial material. They're not going to watch yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. We don't so, take unsolicited material. <laughs> so connection still today, even for distribution, absolutely everything, mm. especially in this situation. I agree, it's okay, that if your movie works, you know, but this is magic. You know, if the stars align and the magic happen and for a combination of coincidence your movie really work mm. sometimes when you watch these movies yeah. you can feel it yeah. you watch it and you're like great this movie work ah, i love it and you know it passed like a second yeah. like the two hours go so fast yeah. and that that is a, you want to call it luck you want to call it magic whatever you call it sometime it happens mm -hmm. these movies they will always find distribution because it's so obvious. Mm -hmm. Everybody that, that is not an idiot, right. you know, from the distribution point of view, understand that will work and want to dis distribute. But how many there are? You know, if I ask you, especially in this platform, you know, if I ask you in Netflix, when is the last time that you watch one of these movies that really work? It's not that easy because I spent so many nights to flipping, 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 start a movie, boring, start another movie, boring, start another moving, boring, and they go to sleep without watching anything. Because, you know, it's like one hour right, flipping right, movies, and right. so you just give up. That means that these streaming platform, they have an immense amount of okay movies. Mm. And these okay movies are being selected on somehow. Because they're not like that great, oh, unbelievable movie that works, that we know will find distribution. Right. right? So... This is also very, 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 very interesting to, to understand that even if the market completely changed with uh, this kind of distribution, TV doesn't exist anymore, and there are infinity ways to stream a movie, right. still distribution is our biggest problem and still work with these freaking connections that there were when I was a kid in, in, you know, in Hollywood. Right. And, and maybe I'm going to say this, that I know it's crazy, mm. but I'm going to say it. Okay. Maybe is where AI eventually in the future may help. And I want to say may, may. Please, guys, don't cut it out in the, in the podcast. I'm going to say maybe, maybe. So it's a maybe, right? That an, will be an AI that is able to at least watch a million movie and understand which one is good in some kind of way and put it in distribution company. Because I know it's not going to be a human so this is very artificial and it's like, Leo, you're crazy. But at least the, pra the practical idea that is possible to watch a million movies possible. Right now, these guys working at Netflix, they cannot watch a million movies. They probably don't watch any movies. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. So an AI maybe in the future can facilitate the distribution. Uh, but how could you? I mean, maybe. It would be so subjective, though. Like, what's good? What's a good film? Or like, you know what I mean? Like the exactly, AI. Can't exactly, 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 exactly. So right now, we also depend by the subjective point of view of these guys working for the distribution company, right? right? But believe me, they really try to be objective because they really want to sell the movie to the wider audience as possible. So they try to think, um, I don't like this movie, but I'm sure it will work, and they take it anyway. Because I, I don't know. Sometimes it happens. I when, heard these conversations, you know. When when I when I look at the movies on Netflix, like sometimes I don't think like they're serious. 
I don't think Netflix is like serious about like putting out great content. It's just like how many reality shows are you gonna do? Like, I agree. You know what I mean? Like, like I don't know. I, I just don't take them serious sometimes. But there is so much behind. There is so much behind you. You're, you're gonna be in, insanely, you know, like so much behind. There are studies sometimes, and there are data coming mm. back. I, I I remember I met a girl that was working in this data, right, for mm. one of these company, okay. and she's like, the data that come back. In all the company, nobody will ever guess. So the data was completely different with the guessing of anybody in the company what kind of movie to produce first, you know? Like very high content of, I don't know, a pet concentrate kind of story. Mm. We need to do a movie with a pet, like one of the main character, and it was like one of the priority. And I'm like, can you imagine to run a studio and one of your priority is make a movie with a pet <laughs> in the main, in, as a main character, you know? Or sometimes, okay, we need uh, to do a reality show where people fight each other. Right. People want to watch that, so it's one of your priorities. So sometimes when the data come back, if they follow the data, right. they're going to make content that, at least for me, that I have no idea why, but I, I'm always the opposite direction of what everybody else loves and like. Do you do you have Hulu? Yeah. I think when I when I when I compare like Netflix and Hulu, Hulu feels like they're trying. Right. You know what I mean? I agree. Um they they just have I mean they take shows that are already like on TV which is cool but the shows that they produce themselves Hulu and Apple TV the shows that they produce themselves right. it feels like they're trying right Netflix like you said you go to start a movie uh, I don't know, start another one you're scrolling for two three hours like I don't even watch movies on Netflix really anymore absolutely this is a very very good point and i agree with you one thousand percent and i think some some companies they have a really really different objective yeah like for example apple tv yeah so apple tv and netflix i think it's obvious what's going on there meaning that netflix tried to do the numbers yeah it's trying to do the biggest amount of movies reality show comedy is like you want to watch a comedy tonight? Ha! About, I don't know, Christmas time? Mm -hmm. Ha! About two guys that they fight each other. Right. And we have 500,000 of these movies right, that right. you can choose. You will never get bored. But maybe it's different. It's actually the opposite. Exactly. Because you will get bored because you don't know what to watch, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't know, when, when you're a kid and you have uh, a PlayStation or something and you cheat and, and you're able to download all the games... <laughs> And then you're like, you're not playing anything. Right, right. But when you like, you are absolutely broke because you're a student and you buy one game for $79 that you've, you, you know, you use like mm -hmm. two Christmas time to put the mm -hmm. money together and you play, you know, you buy that FIFA. Yep. Oh, you're going to enjoy you're gonna that game. You're going to wear that motherfucker out. Yep. You're going to enjoy that game so much. And instead you have, you have an unlocked you know, PlayStation, and you have all the games in the world, mm -hmm. and then after one day, you're done. Exactly. And so sometimes in Netflix, I, I feel the same way. You know, I have so much to choose that is mediocre that I'm just done. And Apple is going the exactly opposite direction, you know. Mm -hmm. They don't have so many TV shows right. or movies, but the one that they have, they're very interesting. They're very, very good. Yeah, I am in, in Amazon, in um, Apple Plus, Many, many nights, mm -hmm. you know. Silo, I'm yep. watching Silo. Just finished that. I'm yep. watching Ted Lasso. Come on. Mm. Ted Lasso was I, such I, a I, masterpiece. I haven't watched that one yet. That, that's the next one I'm going to watch. Insane. You would be so surprised. Mm. And I was pushed to, to, to watch Ted Lasso because from the trailer, I didn't like, yeah, right, right, right. But then right. a friend of mine said, Leo, I know you very well. You will love Ted Lasso. And he works so much. Mm. Such a brilliant, you know, yeah. TV show. It's not only a comedy. He gives you, you know, stories and feelings. I, I love it. And there are so many like this. And I love the fact that there are not an infinity number of TV shows. Right. But the one that they are there, the, the quality is very high. So Apple TV, 
decide, I'm sure, to go in a different direction. You know, yeah. we're going to do less TV shows, but more quality. Yeah. I think Netflix enter, um, they, in a way, didn't have an option because they started with this DVD system, the right? DVD, right. They had a collection, so they start the business and they invented the business in somehow right. of streaming, putting all the... Uh, you know, movies that they had online, mm -hmm. all these DVDs that they had online, because mm -hmm. the archive that Netflix had was huge. Mm -hmm. So they start as a model in this way to mm -hmm. put the archive online. And the first people, you know, join Netflix online because there was a big archive. They were like, oh, great, finally a place I can go online where there are a, a lot of movies. Mm -hmm. Yay! But I think what happened, then this is very interesting, mm -hmm. is that society changed in a in a in a in a way mm. to watch movies. You know, like if in the beginning there was more, there there was there was more like uh, an anger to have a place with a lot of movies. Right now that we have we are bombarded with with media everywhere. Yeah. Maybe the society is like no. I changed. Hmm. I don't want a place with a ton of movies. I want a place with quality. Right. Maybe right. they did change. And so Netflix is suffering a little bit right now because a lot of people are doing the exactly same thinking that we did. Yeah. There are there is too much content and too much mediocre or so bad. Too much mediocre content. Yeah. I want the good content. Yeah. Or at least an AI that works for me. I think another problematic is that in Netflix. I don't think so that anybody's happy with the, f with the movie that they put in front of them, you know? Mm. Or another problematic is that we share our account with so many people <laughs> <laughs> that we end up to mess that up what we like and what we don't like, you know? Right, right. And so I think at least Netflix need to invest a big amount of money. I'm going to say a big amount of money. When I say a big, I think more than 50% on working on this AI. Right. And make it in a way where when Leo go open Netflix, you need to show me what I really like. Mm. Because today you have the technology to do that. Mm. You don't have excuse, you know. Right. And instead... The page is full of, of, of movies that I don't really care <laughs> why they're there. If your archive is right now, I don't know, 10 million movies, yeah. right, Netflix, and you have a very powerful AI. Right, right, right. Why I all the time don't like anything that is in front of me, you know? Mm. It's very interesting. I know that you can push stuff as well. The top 10 works very well, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. Meaning that... This is something that, for example, the studios are expert on it to try to convince the big mass that you are going to like that movie. Right, and right. We're, and, we're, and we're watching this in these days, absolutely, with right. Barbie, right? Right, Barbie. right. People are, going to people are going to watch Barbie because people are going to watch the movie. Mm -hmm. That's it. Because right. other people are going to watch it, so they're going to watch it too. Because if you ask a real explanation why you're so you know, interested about this movie, there is not really a reason. They want to go to watch the movie <laughs> to be able to go back to the office and have a conversation about it. Right, right, right. And the studios always did that. Previously with Harry Potter mm -hmm. or other movies, they're very good on pilot and pushing the mass yeah. to go to watch this movie. And they even went in extreme that they create something like Watch Barbie and, and the other uh, movie from Christopher Nolan. Uh, Oppenheimer. Yes. So it become a thing. You need to go to watch together this movie. <laughs> Why? Go sit in the theater for six hours and watch this. <laughs> you, you know, they were able to convince the people that the trend of today, you are a very cool guy today mm. if you're going to watch these two movies together take pictures in front of billboards and put it online and you are a cool dude. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. And that worked. Right, right. That's, that's the market. That's that free marketing that they want. I know, that's I know. Free marketing. So I, I think a lot of it works in that direction too in the past and, and now it's, it's a little bit less effective with, the, <coughs> with streaming because yeah. um, 
there is not much advertisement ar around. It's more like you open your app and you watch whatever you want. You know? Right, right. And it looks like a lot of people are not very compatible with you watch whatever you want. <laughs> so this is true. It's very this interesting. No, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, Leo, Le 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 I, I want to kind of talk about um, your family history. Right. Um, as well, I mean, we could talk about the you know Netflix and Apple TV all day, uh, but I, I do want to talk about um, you know, kind of like your family history, right? Um, your uncle was yes, Sergio Corbucci is Sergio. is one of the uh, most interesting um, filmmakers right now in a lot of different way, mm. meaning that um, I think. A lot has to do with Quentin Tarantino. Yeah. You know, that today is one of the um, most successful and legend filmmaker of all time and he's yeah. still alive. Yeah. It's, it's a big plus, you know, and so you want to you want to to know more is possible about him. And he's a humongous, insane fan and supporter of Sergio and Bruno Corbucci. Okay. I never met them because I was too little and, and they died before my time. Right. But in my family, there was always the legend about, about them, right? And uh, Now, Ser Sergio was your uncle? Uncle, yeah, from my, father, from my father's side. And then, so, wait, wait, wait. Was he your great uncle or like yes. your uncle? Oh, your great uncle. Okay. And Bruno was... And Bruno a, is his brother. So, his it's, bro okay. it's the same thing. Uncle, yep. And they did an uh, immense amount of movies. The mm. number of movies that they produce in Italy is, is insane. So mm. if you Google it, you will find out and, and even question yourself, how in the world in one life you have time to do all these movies, right? Mm. And so back in the time, um, they didn't get enough recognition for what they did. Now, they were around in the 50s? Yes, in 50s. the 60s, 70s. And, okay. And... and and so they were uh, big in the genre movies, you know, yeah. like what we call poliziesco. That means, you know, like when police is involved and, and there are detectives going okay. around. They were in the giallo, what we call giallo, that means yellow, that for us is a genre too. That okay. is like when there is a murder and there is something behind. Mm -hmm. And then they did a lot of westerns as well. That yeah. I think they're some of my favorite movies, mm -hmm. like The Big Silence. And and so I don't think so they were recognized enough back in that time. Mm. And and honestly, I don't have an answer why. I really don't. Because maybe it's because we had filmmakers like Fellini, mm. Antonioni, Rossellini, that they were so big, even mm. worldwide. You need to understand that back in the time when Fellini was alive, the box, the box, box office, the best box office in the world where Fellini movies are as well. Mm. So in the number one, worldwide, there was La Dolce Vita, or mm. Eight and a Half, even in America, in Australia, right. and, you know. So they were international, uh, you know, what today is Hollywood, for a long time, Italy was after the Second World War, mm. with this neorealism, right? Okay. With these new directors. And then in the, in the, in the late 70s, the visual impact arrived of Spielberg, George Lucas, so to go to movie theaters become more like an experience yeah. and a visual impact. Yeah. And Hollywood really flourish with that, with Spielberg, you know, Lucas yeah. and all of this. But you believe it or not, in the beginning was a matter of stories. So the number one movie for a long time in the world box office was, was La Dolce Vita. And there are no CGI, there is nothing. And I probably, if you put La Dolce Vita today in the movie theater, you will not have anybody. <laughs> like zero. Seriously, nobody, you mm. know. Even if you put the movie in YouTube, you right. will have like 25,000 views. <laughs> and that was the most watched movie of all time back in the time. Wow. So the audience changed so much. Definitely. Now, um, Quentin Tarantino was that person said that when, ah, 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 no, 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 guys. This Sergio Corbucci was a great filmmaker. Mm. He was a very great filmmaker. He was a pioneer of his time. And so I remember the first time that he was talking about this, and, and my hand called me and told me about this interview. This People were like, huh? 
you know, what, what is he talking about? Because we didn't celebrate Sergio and Bruno enough for what they did in the direction that they did. And, and he, they were pioneers, you know. They were talking about violence when nobody was, was, was doing that in movies mm. because there was kind of, you know, like stigma on it. And, and they, were be, they were able to do like even a Western or superficial movie for, for a lot of people, but then the, the symbols and the message behind was, was very big. Right. That was able to go to the mass. So Tarantino was right. Mm. So Tarantino did, in a way, stimulate our conscience of he was a great director and mm. we should revalidate mm. him. And that happened, you know, the world actually opened his eyes and said, huh, Quentin Tarantino maybe is right. He is a good filmmaker, and we didn't give the space that that he deserved, mm. right? And so I'm really, I'm 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 really, you know, mad that this happened, and and Bruno and Sergio didn't didn't receive the amount of respect back in the time, yeah. you know, and they needed somebody like Quentin Tarantino. That also because it's Quentin Tarantino, so he's, you know, he's able to multiplicate what he says. Yeah. For a lot, because a lot of people are listening to him, Definitely. and and here we are. The paradox that today Sergio Corbucci is 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 more famous than any other time <laughs> of the history of this planet and mm. and his career, and and so I'm so glad about about this with Quentin. Yeah. And I even talked to Quentin about this. You yeah. know, I I went sometimes in in the set just to see how he does movies, and. I is very genuine in in love with this kind of uh, filmmakers from Italy that did a genre kind of movie yeah. that, that people didn't didn't talk about it, yeah. and so I'm glad he did, and I'm glad that now uh, the movie of, of Sergio and Bruno are being watched again, and and this is also one of the reasons that that I told you I have a dream that maybe we can do a a Western film festival. Yeah. And I can find some of the 35 millimeter prints mm. of, of Sergio and be able to print to to project it again to a movie theater. You know, this will be a, a dream for me that if we have an audience and we are projecting a 35 millimeter copy of, of one of the movies that we like of, of Sergio Corbucci, and in 2023, 2024, here we right. go. There is the movie theater full of people watching mm. uh, uh, a movie of Sergio Corbucci in the movie theater. Right. That would be such that'd a... That would be insane. Yeah, that, that would be, be insane. insane. And, and uh, I'm really going to try to do this because I think it's beautiful that you can organize something like this and thanks to Quentin Tarantino as well that, yeah. that this is possible, you know? Yeah, definitely. And so I, I, I used to like Quentin a lot for the movies before. I was a big, big fan from, you know, like the, the first movies. But when all of this happened, eventually I become even uh, a bigger supporter of him because now, man, it's, it's it's like a, a saint of right. a of a cult of a religion, you know. So when when he said, I don't know if you remember the exact time where he said it, he was doing an interview and just kind of sp spilled it out. Yeah, or? right, wow. right, 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 wow. right. Yes, he was like uh, in the already from the early. I think if I'm not wrong, you believe it or not. One of the first time that Quentin Tarantino become famous mm. is not in the United States. No. I think, because he told me this story, but I don't know if I, I remember correctly. Mm. But I think that his first movie, uh, that I think is Reservoir Dogs? I don't remember. But his first movie was projected at Courmayeur Film Festival. That is a festival in Italy, between France and Italy in the Alps. Mm. And he was there personally begging and saying, guys, guys, please take the movie. I want to show the movie to more people are possible. Please, please, please. He was on the festival by himself and nobody knew him. Mm. Zero. And that festival, Courmayeur, really discovered him and said, oh, this, this movie is insanely good. Mm. And people start to talk about it. And the Italians start to talk about it. And French start to talk about it. And Europeans start to talk about it. Mm. I think Quentin Tarantino... I believe he was born in Europe even before United States. 
Mm-hmm. And people were like in love with Quentin. If it's not his career, I think the love, the extreme yeah, yeah, yeah. love of Quentin Tarantino maybe started in Europe before of the United States. Wow. And I think today, the, he has a biggest audience in, in Europe, mm-hmm. I think. But not the audience that know who he is. Right. The audience that really deeply love him, you know, mm. that know everything about it, that watch all the interview. And so I remember, if it wasn't in Kurmayer, in this very, very beginning of his career, in his interview, he started to talk about Sergio. Mm. And I was like, look at that. That's crazy. He loves Sergio and he loves his movies and he's continued to, to bring it out. And be influenced, you know, the eight full eight is, is in a way an homage of, of uh, the Western of Sergio, you know, yeah. the, the great silent. Yeah. And he's inspired by that in, in, in the snow with this kind of, and, and, and also, you know, he, he, he was so influenced by him. I think it's, it's, in, it's insane. Well, he, re- he, he did a Django and Chain. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He did Django that. He used the same music, first of all. The same, really? Yeah, one of the songs in the movie, Django, yeah. that, that was made for the wow. first movie of, of Django, of Sergio. And he, he's, you know, he twisted the plot here yeah. and there. The movie is very different, yeah. you know? And, but the inspiration was, was, was crazy. Wow. And I love it. I love yeah. the fact that, that also you know, is able to take this inspiration of, of Sergio Corbucci movies and twist it in his way and they have a, such a huge audience. Yeah. Because that, in a way, proved his point. Mm. He was right. He was right. Sergio was a great director. In right. fact, he's influenced by him and millions of people today go to watch his movies that are influenced by him. So mm. there is there is something true in what he says, you know? Definitely. It's, it's, a, good, it's a good fairy tale, I think. So I can't wait what he's going to do next. Yeah. But, really. What, um, how, how did Sergio, <clears throat> excuse me, how did Sergio and Bruno um, influence, like, your career? And you know what you're trying to do with him. Um, I from with that side of the family, I wasn't really connected at all, mm. you know. So as a like, how much help did you receive, Leo? Right, none, you know. So oh. I didn't really start my career going in the movie set of Sergio and Bruno. Right, right. Because again, I never met them. Right. Because I, you know, they weren't alive when I was alive. I always heard about it you know and um, I watched a lot of things I watched a lot of movies that only after I I realized and and known that were Sergio and Bruno movies right because right. in Italy they were they were putting these movies over and over late in the night right I was watching you know and there is a there is a big series called Bud Spencer and Terence Hill and some of these movies are classic in Italy from like you watch it during the night, you mm. know, you just put it in the background. And and then I find out there were Sergio movies. Mm. And I was like, wow. You know, I was always impressed on the numbers of 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 the amount of movies that he did. He had such a big and long career. How, how many movies did he estimate? I don't know. I honestly don't know exactly, but I would say more than 150. More than one fifty? I think it is. Holy if you sh- if you calculate the the movies for the TV, right, and everything, right. I think he did more than one fifty. And um, I remember I I went to Cinecittà, that is the big studios in Rome, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, I did a documentary. I think one of my first thing after film school in Italy was Cinecittà history, Cinecittà story. That was a documentary with collaboration of Cinecittà, mm-hmm. and. In the studios inside Cinecittà, I found a lot of things about Sergio. Mm. That was crazy too, you know, with Fellini, Antonioni. I find out people that they knew him. I find out pieces of movies like, uh, you know, like statues of costumes mm. or in archive. I remember I find in archive even copies of, of some of, of their movies that they told me, hey, we don't know who are these belong to, you know. Nobody claimed this movie. They're here. They're belong. You know, they they just we just have it in in the archive. Wow! And that was crazy. 
and uh, because the amount of movie that that have been produced in Italy in that time and and Quentin didn't start to talk about this movie this this director yet so wasn't known like yeah. like today yeah and so the influences was was almost like an angel in the sky mm. that, that is looking right and then um growing up i my admiration i need to be honest as well grew up also thanks to quentin as well mm -hmm. because quentin pointed out aspect and things that um i wasn't focused that much right. yet right? right because you have so many directors and 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 icons in your mind that sometimes you don't you don't see the one that are closer to mm. you and so i i always watch the movies with an eye of of an objective uh, you know audience but now when i'm watching again the movies i i'm i'm much closer to to what they're trying to say because mm. i'm being educated maybe by right Quentin, right and and i have a lot of stories you know mm. i have a lot of stories uh, and a lot of uh, feedback and and the amount of movies that 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 you can go so deep on, mm. on on watching these movies right right and maybe this change your taste as well maybe the more you know the more you get educated and your taste start to change and you start to appreciate these movies definitely because sometimes i go to to the new beverly right that is the new the movie theater of quentin tarantino and i watch movies that quentin put there and i go with friends and they tell me what the heck why did he put this movie here i don't understand this movie was silly it doesn't make any sense. Right. But instead, inside me, I was like, no, instead I got it. Mm. I know why he put it there. I enjoyed it in, in one direction. Right, right. Because I was educated differently. And this happened to me even with Sergio Corbucci movies today. Sometimes I re-watch movies that I remember I watched when I was 18, 20, mm -hmm. many times. But now I'm like, wow, now I like it more, mm -hmm. much more. Even if people think that it's a silly movie, now I appreciate more because I don't know. I've been educated in a, in a different way. Right, right. So it's 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 very crazy to think about something like this. Yeah. And and also the movie industry was different back in that time because the audience was different. You know, Definitely. we were like telling a story. Sometimes movies were like I tell you a story, and the camera is just the device that is recording the story. Right. And today is we're much, much more concentrated on how you tell that story, mm. you know? Mm. So it's a different perspective as right, well. Right, right. So this is, this is, the, this is everything. You are, you're part of the DGA, right? Right, right, oh, the uh, Director's Guild. How, how long have you been a part of the, uh, the union? Maybe seven years. Seven years. like this, okay. yeah. The Directors Guild is amazing. I really, I really like it, and uh, I think maybe is the best guild that 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 I heard that I may think because I don't know. He focuses really on the quality, on the connect the people to have um, a conversation all together on right. how we can do better right, on right. being storytelling tellers. Um, the the first time I I joined I remember was after Legendary ID the documentary I believe I knew so many first ID that did insane movies like Godfather Superman Batman Pulp Fiction mm. this and that and and entering the DGA and and see that these masters also come to have a conversation after the movie yeah. you know and explain that was really something unique in a way. I don't know. The feeling is like the the Jedi Council. Mm. You are there. Everybody are like very quiet, low key. Yeah. But when they're talking, you are listening and you are learning a lot. Right, right. So I I really enjoyed. Then during the pandemic, of course, you know a, a lot of things changed because you couldn't go there to watch the movie to see the, you know, the screening and the Q and A. But I think the DGA is is helping a lot. Um, filmmakers to to remember why we're making movies mm. right that that is, is important mm. as well and i remember that he was um i think the dga changed when uh, he was frank capra back in the time mm. 
So there is a very interesting story. So there was a time that Frank Capra was the president of the Academy. Okay. And the president of DGA at the same time. At the same time. At the same time. Oh, wow. But the two associations were fighting with each other because the DGA, that is a union, right, was asking for some minimum wage to the studios to survive. Right. And the studios, obviously, that they wanted to capitalize on money, <laughs> they didn't care at all. So I don't know if this story is true, but it's in his biography. And, and he tells that at the night of the Oscar, when he was the president of both associations, yeah. People were very focused to see what, you, uh, what he has to say about, about all of this. Who right. is right? Who is wrong? And that night, that is a live event, I think one of his sons died by a car accident. The same night. So, here we go. Five, four, three, two, one, go. And this guy is in the stage. His, 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 his son died with car accident. He has the studios pushing in one direction and say, you better right, follow right. us right. on this striking. I don't know what happened. I don't remember what happened, but it was something like a strike on an agreement. Yeah. And in the other side, there was DGA and say, you better follow us. And I remember that the pushing of the studio was, you need to dissemble the director's guilt. You need to... Cut it. Yeah, destroy the, the, the guilt. Wow. You know, and, and make it over so we can have total control. Right. And so Frank Capra was there in the stage and everybody was waiting to see what he's gonna say. He will defend the studios, he will defend the director's guilt. Right, right. His his son died in the same night. The, the amount of pressure in this person in that moment, I think. So was, so he already had known that his son had died. Correct. Wow. He was insane. Wow. And he was alive, meaning that nobody knew if he will say, I will step down from the DGA and close DGA, or I will step down from, you know, be the representative of uh, the academy. Academy, right. And in that night that you can find, I think, in, in YouTube, in front of everybody, he will say and defend the director's guilt wow. and go on and on on talking about the rights to be a director, we need to be protected because we need to be able to be free, to have a voice, mm. to do quality, to follow the project that we love, right. and to be respected and have a power that is outside the studios. Mm. And the studios were furious about that reaction, yeah, but that, that even if the director's guild already existed, that was the moment that Directors Guild flourish right, right. and become what it is today. Wow. That is, you know, so a Jedi Council. Right. So <laughs> you guys aren't going on strike or anything anytime soon. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Uh, okay. I will not be that sure. I mean, the union are pretty connected. And the problematic is why is is very wide. Yeah, yeah. You know? So it is not only a uh, uh, actor problem is also screenwriter and there is a new a, a new problematic that we didn't talk today that is a, about AI use in, in, in filmmaking you know yeah. like uh, I need to be honest is, is in front of the door the, the possibility to use AI to replace actors it's it's really 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 <laughs> next door and um, you know people don't understand that Movie stars will continue to exist, maybe even be helped by AI. Leonardo DiCaprio can make movies until he died. In 99, right. he can be young and make a movie, even if he doesn't step in the stage, because the IP, you know, the copyright right, of his right. image, right. when he was 20, 30, is attached to a model, and he will make a new movie. Studios will love this because they capitalize on stars, and stars will love this, because they will continue to make movies for, for, for forever, you know? Yeah. And this can really happen. The IP and the copyright attached to the image in the AI form in a movie can yeah. really happen. And so who is going to suffer in this situation? 
are the everyday actor. Oh, yeah. Like, if we have a scene, for example, in a coffee place, and there is Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt talking, and they're 99 years old, and the copyrights continue to fall of them beautiful and young, right? You only need to pay the copyright of these two actors because all in, the, in that scene in the coffee place, all the background actors, the server that come and, and pour, pour coffee, these can be generated AI characters from zero. And so you don't need to pay the copyright to anybody for these people. But, but, but what does that do for the community? He destroyed. It destroyed. He destroyed the community. He destroyed a lot of jobs. He destroyed a lot of, you know, families. He removed a lot of so, work. So, so why would? It's, why, why, so why would production companies want that? For profit, because they can capitalize and make more profit. Be able to use the stars for longer, longer, longer. How how much and, profit do and, you need, Leo? I know it's insane, but it's also going deeper than this. Yeah, there is an Israeli guy now that is using a technology. Um, I, I, I am working for uh, Next, mm, uh, Next Media, that is a VFX company. Okay. And I find out that there is this kid from Israel that is using um, the, something that we already use that is an um, Unreal Engine, right? Unreal Engine is a, is a CGI, is a computer graphic um, background that you can use in a movie, and when you move the camera the background move with the camera, right? Mm -hmm. And so you can use, like, um, Mandalorian use this technology a lot, mm -hmm. and so you can create an environment and change the light, day, night, forest, yeah. and then and then putting these people in front of the monitor with the camera looks like they're there. And it's very efficient because also the light bounce, and if it's like a forest, the green bounce, and it's, mm -hmm. the, you know, it, it's very useful yeah. for light as well. Even if it's not that simple, you need to adjust lights as well. Yeah. But it's better than green screen because green screen, you don't see what is in the background. You have green spill, you know, when right. you move the camera, you need to key. So this technology is great. But this kid, what he did, he used the Unreal Engine and he used GPS on the camera to do the opposite. So he's shooting in a real location and the Unreal Engine is instead to be focused on the background, that is a lot of space and a lot of calculation, is focusing in a smaller line and is creating an AI character mm. on a real set. Oh, wow. So the camera is moving in the set that is real and there are some keys where the character can go and cannot go and the character is using their real engine, I don't know how, and instead to generate a background, the Unreal Engine is making a character. And so he needs to focus on, on uh, polygons right. of a character. Right. And it's very believable. His movie is about a monster. So the main character is a monster. Mm. So he said he works much better with you know, non-human uh, elements because right. obviously you, know, you, don't, you never saw a, a monster. So you don't know how it is. So right. it's more believable. And he said that he's, uh, this is the paradox. is much more compatible with today kind of movies. He said, Leo, it will be easier for me to make the next Avenger, to make a movie where, where people need to fly, uh, shoot laser from the eyes, right. give a punch and destroy a wall, mm -hmm. than do your independent movie with myself. My software will not be able to do your independent movie with, with myself. Mm. Because the expression of this girl, real girl, so organic right. in front of the monitor with the only light of the monitor right. with little makeup and you see all the imperfection that is so organic that my software will not be able to replace it completely 100% and the audience will understand that that girl there is not real. Not real. But because in today movies the biggest box office of today are the Avengers, you know, uh, all the CGI movies. Yeah. The audience is already used to it. So if his software make a character that fly and punch and this looks a little bit fake, right. the audience psychologically, they don't care much yeah, yeah. because they're used to. So what a paradox that the technology of AI of making fake characters right. is actually more compatible with the big blockbuster of the studios mm. rather than 
the independent days, mm. independent movies. I love the fact that maybe in the real future, like 50 years, I don't know, 100 years, I don't know, 10, 5 maybe only, some people may say something like, hey, did you watch that movie that was made with real actors? That was good, wasn't it? Yeah, it was really different, wasn't it? And maybe independent movies may become something like a niche of movies made with real people. What about that? That's crazy yeah, to that, think about. That it. would be, oh god! I mean, that would ruin the whole Hollywood community. Like, but in some, in somehow, we are going this direction. In somehow, the these Avengers movies, these X Men, these old CGI movies, yeah. are a lot about the visual effect and right. less about the the human aspect, the people, the stories. I mean. I like some of them, some of them, but honestly, if I ask you to tell me the story of the last Fast and Furious Avenger movie, X Men, I mean, I'm you're I not mean, gonna remember. I mean, Fast and Furious, no. Um, I mean, you know what I mean. The story is not the the main thing. The 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 human feelings. If I make an independent movies without CGI, yeah. I'm obligated to intrigue yeah, the, the, you. The story is everything. With the story. Yeah, yeah. I don't have any other weapon in, right. in my side, you know. But today, the big audience is more interested to see something visual. So the AI generating characters, they will speed up. They will go fast in the industry also because the audience want that. The big stuff. He want that. They're but compatible with that. But I don't think, I don't think people... I don't think people go see like Marvel movies. I don't think it's for the CGI. I think it's for the story. It's for the characters. And like what like the the whole trajectory of this whole universe. Like I I believe I agree 100%. Yeah. I'm a big Marvel Marvel fan as well and yeah. I want, you know, I want to see Captain America or because I love their stories. Right. I agree 1000%. But then all these kind of movies that they have so much CGI like them, they come right. after. Like there is there is a big movie right now about a shark coming out that is in the movie theater, you know, it's mega Oh, movie. the Meg, yeah, 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 yeah. something yeah. like that. Yeah. Or an horror film with, with a lot of CGI movies that so they really drive the audience to go in one direction. Yeah. Like we said, that in the 70s the movies that they were in the box office, number one, two, three, they were stories. Right. You know? Right. They were because because the most popular movies were storytelling and, and the audience went in that direction. Today, even if I go to watch Marvels for the stories and for the universe that they have that I really enjoy, yeah. then the audience are used to that. Mm. And so if I use my software that generate C CGI AI characters. And in the beginning, I will sneak one or two characters <laughs> in the next Marvel that are not real. They already did that in Star Wars. You know, nobody complained, you know, that some uh, of the characters were absolutely digital, you know. Really? Oh, they did multiple times. They did with actors that died. Like uh, Lila, oh, Princess Lila okay. died, and it was in a couple of scenes where it was computer generated, you know. Wow. And so. In the beginning, I can sneak the character there right. and then use it more, more, and more, and more, and more. But believe me, the studio will love to capitalize on the copyright of the movie stars right. that will give them to make movies. Well, I, I, heard, I heard Bruce Willis had already did it because he, mm -hmm. he, he has some health issues or, or whatnot. Right. And he, he signed a deal to where he's getting... I think they say you get like 75 75% of what you would usually get if you actually went. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I think they and I think he did a movie already. Um perfect example. CGI, yeah. Perfect example. They will get less money, so the studios will make even more money. Right. But they will guarantee that Leonardo DiCaprio and 97 years old can make two movies per year. Mm. Think that he will not be able to do it in reality because right. he's getting old, right? And so the copyright for these faces is, is everything. And the audience is happy too because the audience will love to see Leonardo DiCaprio young acting. I don't, don't want to see... If Leonardo DiCaprio is 97 years old, 
I do not want to see a fake ass Leo in at thirty five. Like, <laughs> I don't want to. See, but I mean that that's me. That's pers- just you, and it's already happening. Yeah, in a way. Yeah, you know. So I don't know which direction the future, and I don't think so. Anybody knows because the future always change. Yeah. And honestly speaking, Hollywood is like a phoenix. Whatever problematic there was, he always reborn. Mm. They always able. They were always able to go back in first line. You know, yeah. there were so many things. Yeah. You know, sound. The the introduction of sound was a big change, and then color, and then you know everything. The even China that becomes so big, and we thought, oh my God, China is gonna produce everything, and Hollywood will be. Uh, you know, uh, disappear. Right. No, Hollywood was or, or or streaming. You know, the new streaming will destroy Hollywood. Right, right. No, 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 no. Hollywood is always able to reborn. So, in a new scenario where there is gonna be a software that generate AI characters that go around the set and and with copyrighted faces, in I think Hollywood will find a way to. Reborn as well. I, I, I hope not, man. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I I I like um, I I like good stories, man. Mm-hmm. I, I was I just finished uh on Hulu. It's a show called The Bear. Mm-hmm. Have you seen it? No. I mean, it, it's the I just finished the second season. The first season was great. The second season was like fucking phenomenal. Like. I love it. In, insane. You know what I'm saying? Like, and it's and and I'm watching it, and I'm like, like this is what it's about. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is what one one of the episodes. I think it's episode six on season two. It's probably like one of the greatest episodes ever created for any show. I love it. Like, f- top just chef's kiss, phenomenal, right? Like, and I'm watching it, and I'm like. This is what it's about, like, and that's the magic that I told you about. It. You know, sometimes you are luck, the magic, the star alliance. I don't know, but sometimes it happens. Yeah, and, and I mean, it's just like, why you want to fuck that up? <laughs> like, <laughs> why? <laughs> Who wants to fuck that up? Because they may call it innovation, they may call it technology, they may call it whatever they want. If there is a profit, the studio is gonna. Make it, and the studio maybe today, yesterday w- was Paramount, then become Warner Brothers, and today is Netflix, and right. tomorrow will be uh, Yobik. Right, right. But they will not change that model. That they need to make profit. You know, is is what we said in the beginning of yeah. the show. You know, I yeah. mean, filmmakers need to make money to I mean, survive, yeah, yeah. and the studios need to do the same. Yeah, I mean, no, that that I mean, that's absolutely true, and I don't. But like, there, there, there's, there's more to life than profit. Like, absolutely, there, there's more to life than all right. We made this one this year. We got to make more this year. Then we got to make more the next year. Then we got to make more. Absolutely, I agree one hundred percent with you. And I think a lot of that is personal as well. Yeah. Like, for example, in in my case, right, um, you know, to be a producer, if you want to make money, mm-hmm. you. Take a you take a, a way that is different from, for example, another way that you are a director and you want to tell your stories. Yeah. Right. So even for me, the the fight of, yeah, sure. If 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 you want to make money, you can produce that kind of genre of movies and make more money. But then what? Like you said, right? It's not the same thing. And I think it's one personal and one is the love that you have for what you're doing. You yeah. know? And, and believe me, producer in Hollywood, even the successful producer in yeah. Hollywood, they can be anybody. Mm. Anybody. They can be the best friend of a movie star. And so they connect that with the money. They make a movie and boom, they become producers. Right, right. They can, they can be the guy that they are good with a bank system and, and big... Um, investors and yeah. they become producer. They can be paperwork people that they can do and they become producer. You know, right, right. And they become very successful, right? Like making movies with Brad Pitt, Leonardo mm-hmm. DiCaprio. You know, on the top notch. And but what are you doing? You know, 
compared to maybe a filmmaker like me that is directing independent movies, mm -hmm. but without Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt. Right. But it's because I love to create. Right. I want right. to start from zero and write a script and a story, and I want to play God in a movie and tell my story. Right, you know? right. It's a totally different desire. Yeah. I think one is money and success, and the other one is storytelling and create. And, you know, sometimes I, I, I teach film, film and I tell that to the students. I'm like, uh, you guys need to have a, a talk to yourself mm. and understand what you really want. Yeah. Because so many kids move to L.A. or Hollywood and what they're really looking for is fame, success and money. Mm. And if that is your priority you need to walk that direction. Mm. If your priority is to create story and make movies, you can be broke right, right. and make a movie. Right. A movie can, be cost, can cost zero, absolutely right. nothing. If you really want to do it, yeah. you find, a, you way find a way to do it. You know? And it's so different. And so these kids, sometimes they look at me and they're like, the face is lost because... <laughs> They, I think they honestly didn't know before I asked mm. that they were after the fame, right, the right, money, right. the success. And so why lie to yourself, you know? Yeah. And some other kids instead, they're very, 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 very clear what they want. And right. I'm like, oh, yes, you're absolutely right. I want to do my movie. Right. I don't give a shit about right, right. anything else, the money, this and that. And you know that that kid, nobody will stop that kid right, right. to make a movie, this right, right. movie. Nobody. Right. Right. You need to shoot him in the face right. to be able to stop it. <laughs> there is no other way to stop that guy, that kid, to, to produce his movie. Right. And I think this is a this is a big difference, you know? Yeah, definitely. And I'm not judging, meaning that I'm not saying that, oh, I am a snobbish <laughs> filmmaker <laughs> that I make my movie and I don't care about money. You right, know? right. I'm very bougie and I don't I have my money. No, it's like if you're after money and you're honest for yourself and you want to be a successful producer... Right, take that route. Take yeah. that route. You, yeah. know, you like the excitement, you know, and then, you know, if you are a, a, a filmmaker that likes to be movies, don't be embarrassed that you're not making movies with Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt. Right, right, right. Don't be embarrassed because people with brain will not judge you from the names of your movies. Right, right. This is another discussion that I had with other filmmakers and, yeah. and I'm like, don't don't get depressed. I have I have friends that are depressed because they're not making millions dollar movies, you know? Mm. They they're not making movies with movie stars. Right, right. And I'm like, don't be depressed because you're making a living, you're telling your stories and you enjoy to do that, you know? Yeah. I'm sure if I put you to be the director of a movie where the studio tell you everything that you need to do, you will not enjoy it. You upset. will enjoy only the paycheck. That's yeah. it. That's all about And it's, it's all about the paycheck? If it's all about the paycheck, right. you will not be here. Right. In the first place. Right? Straight up. Leo, man, I hate to stop this, but... I know, I man, know. We gotta go. This is... Uh, we need to eat and drink. <laughs> man, something. Um... Leonardo Corbucci, everybody. Man, we appreciate you for coming in, man. It's, uh, I love talking to you, Leo. You're you, you dope, man. You're dope. Thank you so much. I, I hope I didn't bore people. You know, Italians like to talk oh. a lot. <laughs> and so I'm sorry that the time went away so fast. Nah, you good, man. I we, hope we, it was interesting. We, nah, we got to bring you back, man, because, I mean, it's... There's a lot more questions I wanted to ask. A lot, a lot more things that we could discuss, man. So we'll definitely have you back again. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to close saying that I'm, I'm preparing my next movie that's going to be a comedy that I'm going to shoot in Italy. Give it, give it. Oh, it's going to be interesting, guys. Okay. Yes, dope, yes, yes. Dope, dope. I can't wait to start. If the, um, if the people want to find you, uh, social media, anything, let the people know where they can reach you. Right. I think if they write Leonardo Corbucci, that is my name and, and, and family name, I am unique enough that I think I'm the only guy that will pop up. <laughs> so you can write in Instagram, Facebook, and whatever you want. Or go straight to leonardocorbucci.com. And then from there, there is all the social media attached. 
and there are also all the news and sometimes I give filmmaking course and, okay, uh, and awesome. in different cities as well. So uh, we're gonna go to Utah next, I think. Oh, look at you! <laughs> man, you be so, traveling, man. Oh, so let's see, let's see what happens, guys. I'm very excited. Uh, definitely, definitely, very excited. Good time to be alive. Definitely, we appreciate you for coming, man. Um, the Beyond Hollywood International Film Festival. We will start taking submissions August fifteenth. We will be back in downtown LA next year, April 24th through the 28th. Uh, hopefully, Leo, you're going to be back in the building. Um, we appreciate you guys tuning in. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or watching this on YouTube, please make sure to hit that thumbs up, hit that subscribe button, let that algorithm know that this is the type of content that you want to continue seeing. Um, This is Beyond Take Two Podcast, episode 26. I'm your host, Madge, and we just finished with Mr. Leonardo Corbucci. Uh, We appreciate you guys tuning in. We love y'all. Tune in again next week, and uh, we'll see you then. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you. I appreciate you. Peace, y'all. Beyond Take Two, take a walk beyond Hollywood, beyond the lights, camera, action, is the heart.